very excited to introduce our keynote speaker of the night, author and retired CMO of Chick-fil-A, Steve Robinson. Hey, what do you think that sign says? Mm. Eat more cheese. What's the word? like eat more cheese. Or eat more chili. Chocolate. Eat more chocolate. No, no, it's chocolate. Chickpeas. Can we count it as cheesecake? Chewing gum. It could be chewing gum. It's not how you spell chicken. I'm pretty sure. When I was uh, in college at Auburn University in the Northwestern, one of my dreams was to have a job in Atlanta, because I grew up in the South, LA, Lower Alabama. And, um, and I went to Northwestern, and all my classmates were from North of the Mason-Dixon line, and they didn't understand why I wanted to get back to Atlanta. I just told them, once you live in the South, once you live in paradise, that's where you want to go back to. But I never dreamed I had the opportunity to be associated with this kind of work. Um, and quite frankly, I had a 43-year career, eight years, uh, first with Texas Instruments, seven years with Six Flags. The last four of Six Flags, I, I was director of marketing at Six Flags Atlanta. And uh, I'm going to start my story in the summer of 1980. But by the way, well, I'm only hitting the highlights this June. Uh, my story and the Chick-fil-A story comes out in a book published by uh, HarperCollins. So, by the way, it is on Amazon.com for pre-order. So, order now on, <laughs> order now on over, order often. <clears throat> so, it's summer of 1980, and I've eaten Chick-fil-A occasionally, but they're a small little regional restaurant located only in malls. My phone rings one, one night at Six Flags, and it's Jimmy Collins who's the COO, and in fact, he had been an independent restaurant consultant, and he helped Truett literally design his first Chick-fil-A store, which I'll show you in a minute. Jimmy's calling. We had met before. He calls, and he said, Steve, I'm calling. I know you got a great job at Six Flags, which I did. I loved it. I mean, my goodness. In Atlanta, Georgia, director of marketing. I, was in, I thought I had it. He says, um, we don't have a marketing department at Chick-fil-A. Your name keeps coming up. I wonder if you'd be willing to talk to us about possibly starting a marketing department for Chick-fil-A to help operators grow their sales. We just simply don't have what they need to build their business. And I didn't hesitate very long to say I'd love to talk because my first eight years had been with publicly held companies, a lot of focus on quarterly earnings. Six Flags had just come out of a bankruptcy settlement with PINCO. I didn't feel good about the way we were investing in the customer experience, so I told Jimmy I'd love to talk. Now, I interviewed with Six Flags, originally Six Flags over Texas, for one day, and I got the job that night. So I figured, okay, two or three days. All right, let me fast forward to December 1980. I'm still interviewing. And it's stealth, remember, because I have a job I like. And I'm sitting in the office of this man. His name was Truett Cathy. If you don't know his story, Google it. I don't have enough time to tell you the whole story, but he is, he is part of the greatest generation. He passed away in 2014. He started a little restaurant in Hapeville, South Atlanta, and it's there where he created the Chick-fil-A sandwich. Now, by the time I'm interviewing with him, they have roughly 140 stores. They have sales of a little over 100 million, and they're, all, they're only in malls. Now, I hope my interview with him is the last interview I'm going to have. And I'm going to use my prop, because if, if you don't get this story, you don't understand Chick-fil-A. So Truett's right here on the couch eating Chick-fil-A sandwich, of course. I would finished mine. I've been in there an hour. Finally, I looked at Truett, and I said, Truett, what are you looking for in the ideal marketing candidate, and am I the guy? Uh, this is getting a little uncomfortable. And I stopped. He didn't say anything. I figure, okay, I think this whole stealth thing is about to come to a conclusion. 
He looks at me, out of, then he finally looks at me and he says, I have absolutely no idea. All I know is whatever it is, I don't want to do it. <laughs> and there's another pause. Now, I don't know about any of you, but I've never heard anybody say something like that in an interview for a potential officer in the business. Then he's kind of like a long comma. Then he says, but this I know, if you come here, it's going to be because you and I can trust each other and have fun. And in fact, I don't think you'll ever leave here. Now, remember, I've just had four jobs in the first eight years of my career. And, I'm, and he said, the reason I'm telling you that is the most important decision we make here is who we invite into the business. I think he's through, and then he gives, gives me one more one-liner that I've never forgotten, and it's the reason I'm telling you the story. We don't train culture here. We hire it. Now, I can tell you a lot of things about Chick-fil-A tonight, but nothing more relevant than I can tell you than that story and that punchline, because it's true with your organizations, too. If you want a sustainable as I like to say, an engaging, enduring, and, 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 and endearing business. It starts inside. Then it migrates to the customers you serve. All right, so I'll put my prop back now. We finish eating, and I go to work for Chick-fil-A January of 1981. And um, probably a lot of reasons I took the job, private company, Great operator model, great menu. I'd done my homework. I mean, after all, I'd had almost six months. But the biggest reason I accepted the job was because of Truett Cathy. And as I'm leaving his office, I notice this on the wall. It's a verse from Proverbs 22. It's actually the first half of verse 1. And it says, a good name is to be more valued than great riches. And as I reflected on that, walking out of the office, I thought, you know what? The biggest reason, if I come here, the biggest reason I'm coming here is because of this man. Because of what's important to him. Now, what I didn't know then was that this verse was his life verse. His mother had made him memorize it for school one day. They still did, they still did that back then. What that told me was this is the guy who cared about his name and ultimately the name of his business. As I said, Truett opened his first restaurant in South Atlanta in 1946. He called it the Dwarf Grill for a very simple reason. It had 10 stools and four booths. He enlarged it a few years later, and he, he called it a house, Dwarf House. And it's there that he developed the Chick-fil-A sandwich. And now, originally, it was called Chicken Steak Sandwich. And uh, he had a sister who owned a card shop at Greenbrier Mall, which was the first, card, the first mall in the city of Atlanta. And Gladys was pushing Truett to bring that chick from chicken sandwich to Greenbrier Mall. She said, there's no food in here that doesn't require you to take an hour and sit down. We need food that we can get, eat on the go. Customers can eat on the go. So Truett was always an opportunistic uh, per person. He cuts a deal with Greenbrier Mall. This store opened in 1967. He paid an artist $50 to develop that logo. And I could tell you how it came up with the name, but that's another story. <clears throat> and this little store was less than 400 square feet. And Jimmy Collins, who I mentioned earlier, was the guy that helped him design it. This little store in its first year did over $180,000 in sales in 1967. You can kind of compound the inflation, and you can see that it was quite successful. So they decided to do another one, and they did another one in 1969 down in um, Savannah, Oglethorpe Mall. Now, this was a turning point in the business. People ask me all the time, or people assume all the time that the chicken sandwich is what makes Chick-fil-A run. It's, it's the true point of difference. And I want to share with you that it's not. This, this, these first two stores was when Truett actually made a decision to stop because he had managers running the stores. 
And when these managers had problems, who did they call? They were calling Truett. Well, Truett's still running the dwarf house. He didn't want people calling him with problems. And he literally called Jimmy into his office one day, who was already working on the third generation design. He said, Jimmy, I'm not doing any more of these. I don't want problems. I don't want people bugging me with phone calls. It's not worth it. Now, Jimmy, in the back of his mind, is already getting a feel that this little concept has got legs. And I don't know how, how it happened, but between the two of them, he got Truett to slow down, rethink that, and they designed the Chick-fil-A operator agreement. And fundamentally, this is the way it works. Chick-fil-A finds a location. Back then, malls, now any kind of location. Chick-fil-A finds a location, builds a restaurant, equips a restaurant, fully stocks it before it, op before it opens and hands you the keys. You're an independent operator. You're covered by franchise law, but you're a non-equity non partner. You pay a percentage off the top for the use of the brand and all the support services of the brand, marketing, accounting, finance, IT, et cetera, et cetera, training. After all of your expenses, and because you're an independent contractor, the employees are yours. They're your responsibility. After all of your expenses, we're going to split the bottom line 50-50. Our half is to continue to grow with you. As you grow, we grow. Helps offset our investment. Your half is your income. When I joined Chick-fil-A in 1981, the average operator, now by, by then they had about 140 stores, the average operator was making about $40,000 a year. Um, I'll, I'll just say that last year, the average Chick-fil-A operator was closer to half a million dollars per year. Now what that meant was Truett figured out a way to attract entrepreneurial talent and the energy and the focus of being fully engaged with customers on the front line. He, his phone didn't ring much. And as a result, Chick-fil-A started to take off. So what was the focus when I came in 1981? Very simple, sell more chicken sandwiches. Uh, it, was, it, it wasn't even really thought of as a, as, as a restaurant, it was thought of as a sandwich shop. So I started a journey of figuring out, listening to customers and listening to operators, how do we sell them more sandwiches? And I soon learned, learned through research, uh, should you think you could come to this conclusion, but I discovered that the mall was not just a place of doing business, it was in fact the primary medium of the business because over 70% of the people eating at Chick-fil-A had not planned to eat there the day they went. So how are we gonna leverage the mall as a platform to market the business. And that led to the first phase of hiring the right talent and literally building the marketing plan from the menu board out. So that's basically what I did in my first year, research and visit stores. 1972, I don't know if I'm, I may be the only one in here who was working in 19, 1982. I didn't. Good for you. <laughs> Congratulations to both of us. 1982, something happens. The economy just hits these skids. Fed's not messing around with interest rates. It's a free market back then. Interest hit 18%. What happens? Mall development basically stops. I mean, malls that even were in progress stopped. Retail sales slows down, and Chick-fil-A's having the first sales decline in the history of the business. Now, as if that's not bad enough, Truett has signed a note to build this out here. True to sign a note to build the first office building. $10 million. He's had to sign his own personal assets to do it. And that's literally him walking, touring the construction site. But as if that's not enough, the first major campaign that I was accountable for to help create trial and awareness of the brand, unfortunately featuring coupons, was so successful that we exceeded the budget by $2 million. Now for a little business that's got total sales of just a little over 100 million, you can do the math, that's a big number. It was an interesting experience for me. I expected the accountants to salt my front yard any day. But what, here's what happened. I went to Jimmy and I apologized, because quite frankly, I was too aggressive. I didn't know enough when I made some of the decisions to be as aggressive as we were. 
uh, maybe borderline arrogance. And I went to him and I apologized. Jimmy Collins looked me in the eye and said, don't worry about it. We just invested $2 million in your education. You're never going to make that mistake again. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Now, I didn't hear a word from Truett. Now, he may have been seething inside, but he never said anything to me. But shortly within this window of a week or two, Truett comes into the office one day, and he meets with us, the Young Executive Committee, who all of us have been there less than two years, except True and Jimmy. And he said, gentlemen, we got a serious cash flow problem. I want to know what you're going to do about it. Now, I just gave you the list of all the things we can't control, right, in the marketplace. And we're thinking, what do you mean? What do you want us to do about it? We took his charge seriously. We went to a small hotel room off-site at Lake Lanier. We spent a day working on tweaking the plans, uh, cutting expenses. We put a freeze on hiring. Um, we went from over 50 stores in the plan to 18. And so at the end of that day, we, we felt like we tweaked it em enough. And by the way, in the marketing plan, we had the introduction of the first new product since Chick-fil-A had been launched, these little finger food things called Chick-fil-A nuggets and chicken soup. So at the end of day one, that's where we were. Day two rolls around, and Dan Cathy, the oldest son of Truett, said, you know, I think we've got to have a conversation about the, the uneasiness, the apprehension, maybe even the fear in the Chick-fil-A family, operators and staff. They need to really understand how we look at this business. Why are we in business? Not, a, not only in a point of crisis, but in times of plenty. So we started tackling the question, why do we exist? Now, we have Truett in the room with us. I'll never forget it. He's wearing a T-shirt. He, he was a piece of work. We start throwing all these phrases on the wall, and this is what stuck. The corporate purpose for Chick-fil-A, to glorify God by being a faithful steward of all that is entrusted to us and to have a positive influence on all who come in contact with Chick-fil-A. Really just three big ideas. Glorify God, positive influence, but this was the point that Truett probably harped on us the most by being a faithful steward. The most important word to him in that sentence is just two letters, B-Y, by. As you can tell, it made an impact on me. And uh, there's no question Truett was, a, he, he, he saw his life in a biblical context. But what he, what he really wanted to be was a good steward on behalf of the God that he served, where every dollar he had, power, position, privilege, he subjected it to the opportunity of serving others. Operators, staff, team members, down the line, thousands of campers, thousands of scholarship recipients, Families within the neighborhoods that Chick-fil-A served. What I learned about this man at the end of the day, what thrilled him the most was not growth, was not cash. It was helping other people to flourish. So I've just summarized for you in that opening two, two crucial stories. My interview and how the corporate purpose came to life. Why I ended up staying at Chick-fil-A for 35 years. Embedded in there, you saw in Jimmy and Truett, another important reason, the freedom they gave me. Because I can assure you, I made not only the $2 million mistake, I had others. And yet, they, Truett Kathy never called me into his office one time to say, why did you do that or you screwed up? Now, what did that do for me? Confidence, freedom, the willingness to take risks, the very fact that Jimmy had my back when I did cost the business $2 million over the budget. <clears throat> this is why um, I had on the, the opening screen, and I didn't write that until the process of writing my book. Culture is the soil in which great brains grow. And the responsibility of leaders is to cultivate that soil. The only reason Chick-fil-A has become what it is today is because of the cultural soil Truett 
and Jimmy Collins created and nurtured and poured into everyone associated with it, with Chick-fil-A, including me. Sorry, went back, sorry. Okay, 1980, that's all the first two years. <laughs> now, I'm gonna speed this up. 1983, the economy is no better, but we had a 36% sales increase. We had a same store sales increase of 29%. We had the mall development wave is over. New platform for, for growth. If we're gonna continue to sustain this business, how are we gonna do it? And literally the last half of the third day at Lake Lanier, we started talking about how are we gonna compete with the big boys on the street? And we began the process of how are we gonna research, design, and test a street restaurant, Chick-fil-A. The first one opened in Atlanta on North Druid Hills at Briarcliff Road. I knew I was getting old when it hit 30 years old, they tore it down and rebuilt it. But this was the original store. It did twice the volume we thought it would do. The major shift in the business, however, was we were no longer just marketing in a captive audience at malls. Chick-fil-A had to be a destination. I felt like I was back at Six Flags. We had to build the brand. We had to build compelling reasons to come to Chick-fil-A. And actually, before that, we had to let people we knew, knew we existed. Our unedited awareness and trial of Chick-fil-A in Atlanta was single digit. And we're gonna, put a, we're gonna start putting restaurants on the street. The brand journey had begun, but we did not change our strategy of building it on the shoulder of the Chick-fil-A operators. And we made the decision that Chick-fil-A operators were capable of doing more than just running a store. They were capable of being the marketing agents in their communities. And we began building the marketing resources and team we need to have to help them do that. They had the leadership capacity. Little did we know the kind of operators we're attracting now, they're, they're entrepreneurs, they're enterprise leaders. And we started building the marketing plan based upon this fundamental model of the operator, local store marketing being our first priority, then the market, and last being national. Simple visual, but a complete paradigm flip to everybody else in fast food. We were also investing roughly half as much money on a percent of sales basis than the competitors. We had a challenge. We felt our greatest advantage to winning was an independent operator marketing a store in every footprint that we operated. Their primary role was to help us keep customers, not just win them, but keep them. And this, this visual captures another major shift in the business. People ask me, quite often, what do you think your biggest contribution to Chick-fil-A was? I brought a passion for the voice of the customer, literally in the first year, and we built, we integrated that voice of the customer into the business. I like to call it informed intuition. We didn't rule out intuition, but conversely, we didn't make all of our decisions based purely on data or payout analysis. We based it on what would add the most value for our customers. You keep the customer priority right, the operators and the owners win. I'll fast forward to the mid 90s. We're now over 500 locations from over almost uh, three quarters are in the southeastern states. It's now to start, it's now time to start entertaining. How do we, how do we fulfill our responsibility at the top of the pyramid nationally? And, the, and we basically approach it very simply this way. What can we do that only we can do to help support the operators? And interestingly, we'd studied all kinds of data, include, including Nielsen and Simon, and we found some of the, the, the most fertile customers in the marketplace were college football fans. They've indexed higher than any other segment in the marketplace, particularly around lifestyle and income. So I invited Diane on a date, my wife, who's sitting right here. 1994, let's go to the Peach Bowl because they don't have a sponsor and they've just moved into the Georgia Dome and they've just signed a contract with the SEC and the ACC and most of our stores are in the footprint of those two conferences. So we have a date. You can go on a date to a college football game 
if you love college football. We're up on the rafters, and there's about 15,000 empty seats. And I turned to Diane, I said, you know, I can't believe this place has got empty seats. Kentucky was playing Clemson, great environment, beautiful building. Um, I said, somebody ought to sponsor this thing. Now, she knew I was chewing on it, but as Diane does so often for me, she kind of cuts through the rhetoric. She said, well, then why don't you do it? And literally, that next week, I sat down with my team, and we decided to at least start a conversation. We spent two years negotiating our first deal to be the Chick-fil-A Peach Bowl, the contract with ESPN that went with it, brought it to the board, or the executive committee, after almost two years of work. Nine of us, the vote is four to four. <laughs> Truett hadn't voted yet. Jimmy Collins turns to Truett and says, Truett, what do you think? He says, I like it. Let's do it. And that literally was the start of over a 20-year journey with this guy flipping the coin at every Chick-fil-A Peach Bowl game and Chick-fil-A progressing from being a, a fairly small bowl sponsor to now a member of the college football playoff sponsorship team. It was also the first year of the Cow Campaign. And here's a, how that unfolded. We did an extensive research uh, and an interview process to retain an agency. This man and his agency won, won our account. This is Stan Richards, based right here in Atlanta, the Richards Group. We went to them with a simple charge. We want emotionally engaging creative. We don't want our creative to look anything like all the other fast food guys. Well, what are the other fast food guys do? Well, they show food, they show a price, limited time offer, a deal, but it's all very transactional. And we told them we want to build the brand. We want to build the brand around the personality of the business and quite frankly around the personality of the founder. That was their charge. Well, how are you going to do it when you don't have any money? It wasn't going to be through television. And they were the ones that talked us in to trying 3D billboards as a, as a platform to test that could work 365 days out of the year. The first board we did was right here in Dallas. If it's not Chick-fil-A, it's a joke. That board went up on the North Toll Road here in Dallas, but it went up with only the rubber chicken on it for a month. There was no headline, there was no logo. And it created a lot of buzz. Then the headline and the logo went up and customers loved it. And our enterprising operators in Dallas printed, I don't know how many, but thousands of t-shirts with this artwork on them and they sold all of them. Well, we knew strategically they were going the right direction. The next 3D board was this one over a brand new store in Atlanta. It was our first restaurant with a double drive-through. It's on um, Paces Ferry Northside Drive, John. You probably go there. It was a hit. Then I come into my office one day and there's these six billboard concepts laying on my desk face down. I've been in a meeting. I come, no fancy creative presentation. I come in, I start flipping them over one by one and I get to the last one on the right and it's this sketch of Eat More Chicken which ultimately led to this board, first Eat More Chicken billboard in Atlanta in the summer of 1996 prior to the Olympics. Chatter, buzz. Now, by the way, the, this board worked so well in Atlanta, we took it to our top 20 markets to see how it performed there. And we had to underwrite, some, we had to underwrite it to make that happen. But this is what happened. Cows got stolen. Radio sponsor, I mean, disc jockeys were doing shows from the ramp with the cows up on the boards. The chatter was unbelievable. And when the cows got stolen in Chattanooga, they went, the story made the wire service. CNN covered it. The buzz was unbelievable. There's no social media back then, remember? There's no internet. We knew we had some. We went back to the agency, said, look, would you take this idea and see if you can create a campaign? In essence, we decided Chick-fil-A was the unburger. Now, what do we do with that and have fun with it? And that's what led to uh, the 
Eat More Chicken, now popular Eat More Chicken campaign. And the first TV spot with the campaign was associated with the first Chick-fil-A Peach Bowl in 97. I think that spot still works. <laughs> it's over 20 years old. Okay, so now it's 2001. I'm jumping ahead. We've grown quite a bit. In fact, we've reached a billion dollars in sales. Jimmy Collins has been there for 34 years, and he decides to retire. He earned it. But we are at a point now where we've moved from being a sandwich to a really good fast food business. We've focused on quality, consistency. We've done some menu innovation. We've introduced waffle fries, nuggets, soups, salads, the first grilled sandwich. But we're maybe the best of a bad lot. We're still a fast food restaurant. And my team and I had read a book called Blue Ocean Strategy. Some of you probably read it. If you haven't, I highly recommend it. And we started wrapping our head around, okay, how do we help Chick-fil-A move from being the best of a bad lot, the best of fast food, and become an experience like no one else? And create, ideally, when we're talking ideal, create an ideal, I mean, a blue ocean brand. And that led to us adopting a strategy around innovation at Chick-fil-A that I simply called Renegade. It's real simple. Whatever the other guys do, we're going to entertain the opposite. They're going to use frozen food, we're going to use fresh food. They're going to treat people like a transaction, we're going to treat them like real people. They use advertising to tell you to here, turn right here or buy this today at 99 cents. We're going to make you laugh and we're going to make you smile. Renegade strategy. All right, so we have gotten to the point that we've embraced blue ocean space, this renegade idea. Now, unbeknownst to us, Schertz has been in none of those meetings. But he has been in some Ritz Carlton's. Now, I'm about to show you a film clip from a, a Chick fil A seminar for operators. And what, what you're about to hear him say, this is the third year he said it. Watch this. It was real simple for Truett. He discovered at the Ritz that when somebody said my pleasure to you, they'd look you in the eye, they'd smile, but you'd do the same thing right back. The whole act of just expressing my pleasure changed the entire environment of the hotel. You know, there wasn't a, it wasn't some sort of fancy statistical or even strategic issue to Truett, even though we're over here thinking blue ocean. He's just asking the operators to say my pleasure because no, he knows it's contagious. Well, what that eventually led to was he and Dan challenging me and my, my group. Marketing took this challenge on. We put together a team to develop what we called second mile service. And we called it second mile service for two reasons. One, we consider operational excellence the first mile. But secondly, the biblical principle of going the second mile that you find in Matthew 5, 41, where Christ challenged his folks, his disciples, you've got to go the second mile when the soldier, after the soldier tells you to go one, I want you to go two. We studied great brands who had great hospitality, and then we spent seven years designing uh, hospitality, second mile service, designing it, testing it, creating a support system for it, in all from the first time Truett said my pleasure till the time when we finally had it institutionalized across 50,000 people and 50,000 team members in 1,000 stores. 
And as Dan liked to say, liked to say that when it comes to service, many of them were Neanderthal. Ten-year journey. Hard to do if you're focused on quarterly earnings. Amazing trip. Hard to do if you want it to be distinctive and consistent, just like two pickles on a sandwich suit. We built the raving fan strategy based upon three key components. Now that we were now at a point where we could put these three together, operational excellence, second mile service, and emotionally engaging marketing, where we, we utilize marketing assets that we only had. How do we leverage our food, free food? How do we leverage the cow campaign? How do we leverage our people? And how do we leverage the local engagement of the operators? Those are the four key components of the marketing pillar. Three key pillars in the raving strand raving fan strategy, all built on local oper operatorship, leadership, and all designed to accomplish one primary outcome, create raving fans. And here's what we knew about raving fans from research, because we engaged people like Fred Reichel at the Bain Company to help us figure this out. They come more often, they tell other people, and they gladly pay full price. How good is that? And so it's an opportunity to create brand ambassadors far beyond any number of operators or team members in the restaurants. We use the brand, the loyalty effect question to measure it every store, every quarter. So every store now knows exactly how many raving fans they have where only the tens are raving fans. So the brand journey now at Chick-fil-A has gone through this course of history, sandwich, unexpected caring service, emotionally engaging experiences and inside and outside the restaurant, to now an iconic brand, and I prefer to use the definition, a brand I can't live without. And um, for me, this is the ultimate expression of a 35-year career that I could have only dream, dreamed about. Unbelievable. At, at times, I felt like an outer body experience watching it. All right, I want to rush forward. Um, and tell you that in 1992, of course, we, we, you may not know it, but we had a little PR crisis in that year, and it really forces, forced us to double down on reaffirming our commitment to honoring everyone with honor, dignity, and respect. It actually resulted in one of the best things we ever did for clarifying our brand positioning. What came out of that research were these four words, where good meets gracious. I could unpack that for you. I don't have time. Read my book. <clears throat> but it led to the marketing department becoming a brand development department. So the challenge of 8 12, 2012 became a blessing. And we built the marketing plan my last three years or around what we call brand touch points, where literally we took the four key environments of the business, media and communications, in-store, the markets, and then national, and what those dots, every one of those dots and every one of those phrases, and you'll see social media and digital, and down here you'll see uh, mobile customer platforms, and we've got our apps, and we've got customer loyalty platforms, and CR. We've embraced the, even the digital social into this mentality that all of it needs to help build where good meets gracious. <coughs> They're not silos, they're not independent projects. These are the components of the marketing plan. I didn't bring it with me, but it's literally a, it's a book. And every dot is not only initiative, but it has a cross-functional team. It's led by a marketing person. And they're accountable to make sure the voice of the customer is used in every one of those initiatives. Um, I feel very thankful uh, that that's kind of the, the footnote upon which I left Chick-fil-A was to go from a department that was focused on selling sandwiches to a group of people, unbelievably talented people, who are now helping to deliver in every touch point of the business where good meets gracious. So where I started is actually where I end. This thing on Truett's Wall, this verse on Truett's Wall, really was his life verse. And it penetrated all of us. And it penetrated the business. And I think it penetrates most of the experiences that you have at Chick-fil-A. My word for you is if you'll focus on the emotional, enduring value of your name, I don't care if you're retail, product, 
e-commerce, if you focus on the emotional enduring value of your name or your brand, you will grow. How do you add, how do you add value to people's lives? How do you make them feel cared for? How do you, how do you move from a mentality that they're a tra transaction to someone the business actually wants a relationship with? The whole mind shift is different. Uh, I've run out of time, so I'm going to try to get to the end of this. There we go. Um, this is the planning template for the business. I don't have time for this tonight. Again, buy the book. Chick-fil-A today, $10 billion business. Last year. Um, operator income, over, as I said, almost half a million. Chick-fil-A now is one of the top 30 brands in America. In the fast food, in the, in the restaurant category, not just fast food, restaurant category, America's favorite. And I realized we'd be, we were on the verge of being a national brand when I got to stand on the field at the Rose Bowl, January 2015, and I see the Chick-fil-A logo in both end zones, and 280 million people saw the cows in seven ball games that weekend. It was quite a trip for me, and I could only wish and pray that all of you in some way, some style, can help shape the brands that, you, that you're working with where um, they're endearing, they're enduring, and they're engaging. And I'll stop with that. Thank you.